Thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. It's my pleasure to introduce Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin III and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley. The Secretary and the Chairman will each deliver opening remarks and then have time to take a few questions. Please note I will moderate those questions and call on journalists and would ask that you limit your follow-ups due to our tight schedule today, and I appreciate your assistance with this. Secretary Austin, over to you, sir. Thanks, Pat. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we just concluded our 10th highly successful meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. But before I get to that important work, I want to say just a few words about a troubling episode yesterday. On Tuesday, Russian aircraft again engaged in dangerous and reckless and unprofessional behavior in the international airspace over the Black Sea. And two Russian jets dumped fuel on an unmanned U.S. MQ-9 aircraft conducting routine operations in international airspace. And one Russian jet struck our M MQ-9 aircraft, resulting in a crash. And this hazardous episode is a part, is part of a pattern of aggressive, ris <coughs> risky, and unsafe actions by Russian pilots in international airspace. Now, I just got off the phone with my Russian counterpart, Minister Shoigu. <coughs> And as I've said repeatedly, it's important that great powers be models of transparency and communication. And the United States will continue to fly and to operate wherever international law allows. And it is incumbent upon Russia to operate its military aircraft in a safe and professional manner. Now, let me turn to the important work of this contact group. Today, our extraordinary allies and partners reaffirmed our unity and resolve in supporting Ukraine's fight for freedom. We were joined again today by some 50 nations of goodwill from all around the globe. And they all understand that Ukraine's battle to defend itself from Russian aggression is vital to, for everyone who values the core principles of sovereignty, self-determination, and freedom. Today we were joined again by my good friend, Minister Alexei Reznikov. He comes to each contact group meeting with a clear message for the next steps in Ukraine's res resistance to Russia's campaign of conquest. And the presentations from him and his team underscore the continued urgency of our support. This contact group has pushed hard to ensure that Ukraine can defend itself from Putin's imperial aggression. Brave Ukrainians stood firm during Russia's ground invasion with the help of their new anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles, which contact group countries have provided. And Russia's, Russia hopes to grind down Ukraine in a war of attrition. But Ukraine has been supplied by more than 40 countries. And meanwhile, Russia has had to depend on Iran and North Korea and has had to use equipment dating back to World War II. So Russia is running out of capability and running out of friends. Putin has now had a year's worth of proof that the United States and the contact group will support Ukraine's right to defend itself for the long haul. But Putin still hopes that he can wear down Ukraine and wait us out. So we can't let up, and we won't. Ukraine doesn't have any time to waste, and I heard clearly today that our fellow contact group members also know that we have to deliver swiftly and fully on our promised commitments. And that includes delivering our armored capabilities to the battlefield and ensuring that Ukrainian soldiers get the, get the training spare parts and maintenance support that they need to use these new systems as soon as possible. And we'll continue to dig deep for new donations. And today we heard updates on our progress and some significant new commitments. Sweden has announced that it will provide Ukraine with 10 Leopard tanks and key air defense components. Norway is partnering with the United States to donate two NASAM systems to Ukraine. The Netherlands is making great progress in initi 
initiating new contracts to ensure that new capabilities continue to arrive on the battlefield. And I want to thank Slovenia for its latest contribution, which helps meet several of Ukraine's priority requirements, including armor. For more than a year now, far-sighted donations like these by members of this contact group have been crucial to Ukraine's fight for sovereignty. And we have provided crucial combat capabilities that Ukraine's defenders will use to further repel Russia's invasion and to exercise initiative and to create favorable conditions on the battlefield. But for Ukraine to protect its sovereign territory and defend its citizens over the long term, we must keep going. So we're going to help Ukraine sustain the tanks, the infantry fighting vehicles, and other armored vehicles that are making their way into the front lines. And we're going to continue urgently training Ukrainian soldiers on the capabilities that we're providing and on a combined arms maneuver tactics that they need to succeed. We're going to keep looking into our stocks and into our budget uh, to resupply Ukraine throughout the year. And we're going to continue to continue our important work in lockstep with our Ukrainian partners to maintain accountability for the security assistance that we're providing. And finally, above all, we're going to stay united. Together we're helping Ukraine fight to live free. And together we're helping to show that rules matter. And together we're helping to advance our shared security in an open world of rules and rights. And so thank you very much, and I'll now turn it over to the chairman for his comments. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Secretary Austin, for your leadership. Uh, this, as Secretary pointed out, is our 10th uh, contact group, and these uh, meetings and, and the donations that come from it would not be happening uh, without the incredible leadership of Secretary Austin, so thank you for that. Uh, your direction remains uh, critical to the future success uh, of the group, and also uh, thank you to the Ukrainian Minister of Defense, Reznikov, uh, my counterpart, General Zaluzny, who was not on the call today, but I've talked to him several times in the past week, and the Deputy Chief of Defense who represented General Zaluzny, General Moisuk. Uh, all of them continue to lead uh, Ukrainians' military in their fight for freedom. Also, thanks to all the Ministers of Defense and the Chiefs of Defense, from 51 participants uh, in today's meeting, including NATO and the European Union. They joined the meeting and they continue to provide uh, critical support uh, to Ukraine. Each nation is contributing what they can to ensure Ukraine has the means to defend itself against the illegal and unprovoked Russian invasion. It's been nearly 13 months since Russia invaded the sovereign nation of Ukraine. Ukraine has been independent since 1991 and has presented no threat whatsoever to Russia. Russia launched and has continued for over a year now a war of aggression in flagrant violation of international law. This is and remains a Russian frontal assault on the rules-based international order that has been in place for 80 years, eight decades since the end of World War II. In the face of this act of aggression, in a war of conquest, this group remains unified. NATO is united, the people of Ukraine are unyielding, they are standing steadfast in the face of the Russian onslaught. Russia remains isolated. Their military stocks are rapidly depleting. Their soldiers are demoralized, untrained, unmotivated conscripts and convicts, and their leadership is failing them. Having already failed in their strategic objectives, Russia is increasingly relying on other countries, such as Iran, and North Korea, as the Secretary pointed out. They're using Iranian drones to continue to terrorize Ukrainian civilians. This relationship is built on the cruel bonds of oppressing freedom, subverting liberty, and maintaining their tyranny. Yet free people will not return to the shackles of tyranny. Ukrainians remain defiant with steel in their spines and courage in their veins, and they have the broad support of the United States and the international community. The Battle of Bakhmut continues, but Ukraine is fighting with valor. With robust defenses, Ukraine has fixed the Russian forces at that city, and they're exacting very heavy costs on the Wagner Group and the Russian regular military. Ukraine remains strong. They are capable and trained. 
Ukrainian soldiers are strength, strong in their combat units. Their tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, and armored vehicles are only going to bolster the front line. Ukrainian precision munitions continue to target the logistics and communication systems of Russia. Lacking effective small unit leaders and absent the proper equipment, this is a grinding attrition warfare that Russia is trying to execute. Wave after wave of Russian soldiers are thrown into the chaos of war, absent any sort of synchronized coordination and direction. Russia continues to pay severely in terms of lives and military equipment for its continued war of choice. Right now, there is intense fighting in and around Bakhmut, and the Russians are making small tactical advances, but at great cost. Elsewhere, the front line remains relatively static, with significant exchanges of artillery, but no significant maneuver gains by either side. Right now, as you know, there is a significant ongoing effort to build up the Ukrainian military in terms of equipment, munitions, and training in a variety of countries in order to enable Ukraine to defend itself. The increased Ukrainian capability will allow the Ukrainian leadership to develop and execute a variety of options in the future to achieve their objectives and bring this war to a successful conclusion. This is an act of brutal aggression by President Putin and the Russian military with complete disregard for human life, both civilian and military. The Russians are wantonly killing civilians in large attacks on civilian infrastructure in densely populated urban areas. The severely undertrained, poorly led, poorly equipped Russian forces are conducting mindless frontal attacks and sacrificing hundreds per day. The political objectives that Putin intended to achieve 384 days ago are obvious to the world, and it should be obvious to Putin, that these objectives are no longer achievable by continuing this war. And Putin can end this war, and he can end it today, and he needs to do so. Free people are not easily conquered, and the Ukrainian people are free and they will never give up in their fight to stay free. Two weeks ago, the United States released another security assistance package, which included high Mars, ammunition, artillery, vehicle maintenance, and vehicles. The nine countries have pledged over 150 Leopard tanks, for example. This group that met today is providing air defense, artillery, uh, regular artillery, rocket artillery, armor, ammunition, and that will be critical to Ukraine's ability to continue the fight. A broad mix of air defense systems have been promised, and they will protect the skies of Kyiv and the free cities of Ukraine. Artillery and armor are going to strengthen Ukraine lines, enable their forces to synchronize fire and movement for either offensive or defensive operations. Long-range fires will challenge Russia's ability to command and control, protect, and sustain their forces. The Ukrainian soldiers wear the blue and yellow of the Ukrainian flag, but the colors of 50 other nations that met today stand beside Ukraine to support the principles of the rules-based international order, a system in place to prevent aggression and uphold the values of liberty and sovereignty. That system is what preserves the peace and provides benefits throughout the globe. As President Biden and Secretary Austin and many others, to include all the leaders of Europe, have said many times that we will remain committed for as long as it takes. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, gentlemen. First question will go to Lita Baldor, Associated Press. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, you said you spoke with your counterpart. Can you give us a sense of the Russians' reaction to the call? Did they suggest to you their defense that this was an accident or intentional or that it never happened? Um, can you just give us a, be a better readout of your call? And General Milley, have you spoken to your count counterpart or are you intending to do so? And do you believe, after what you've seen, that this was intentional? Is this considered an act of war? Well, thanks for the question, Lita. Um, I won't speak for Minister Shoigu, nor would I, will I get into the details of our discussion. I'll just reiterate that the United States will fly and operate wherever international law allows. Now, we take uh, any potential for escalation very seriously, and that's why I believe it's important to keep the lines of communication open. Uh, I think it's really key that, uh, that we're able to pick up the phone and engage each other, uh, and I think uh, that uh, that will help to uh, prevent miscalculation going forward. 
So, Lita, thanks uh, for the question. On the intentionality, don't know. I do uh, plan to talk to uh, uh, my counterpart, General Garizimov. Uh, we have a scheduled call. We'll see if that works out. <clears throat> um, so, was it intentional or not? Uh, don't know yet. We know that the intercept was intentional. Uh, we know that the aggressive behavior was intentional. We also know it was very unprofessional and very unsafe. Uh, the actual contact of the uh, fixed wing uh, uh, Russian fighter with our UAV, the physical contact of those two, not sure yet. That remains to be seen. Uh, but I can't, uh, uh, I can tell you with certainty, though, that we have absolute evidence of, of the contact, the intercepts, et cetera, and it's very aggressive. Uh, you, you've heard about the dumping of the fuel and everything else. We have video evidence of all that. So um, there's, there's no question that that part of it's intentional. The actual physical contact of the aircraft, that I'm not so sure. Uh, so we'll have to figure that out. That we're not, we're not positive of that yet. As far as an active war goes, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go there. Incidents happen, um, and, and uh, clearly uh, we do not uh, seek armed conflict with, uh, with Russia, and, uh, and, and I believe that uh, uh, at this point we should investigate this incident uh, and move on from there. But we will continue to exercise our rights in international airspace. Okay. Let's go to Dan Lamoth, Washington Post. Gentlemen, thank you for your time today. Uh, Secretary Austin, uh, announced and likely presidential candidates already have declared that Ukraine should not be an American priority. Uh, given that the Biden administration <coughs> has promised to support Ukraine for as long as it takes, are you concerned that election rhetoric could undermine uh, support for Ukraine in Congress or with the American people? Uh, and then uh, Chairman Milley, uh, the MQ-9 came down in the Black Sea where the United States has not had any uh, military vessels uh, for more than a year. Um, is it fair to say that the U.S. will not recover this MQ-9? And do you have any concerns about what value it might have to Russia, either strategically or for propaganda? Thank you. Um, thanks, Dan. I, I would, uh, in terms of the importance of, uh, of Ukraine, first of all, we've, we've seen bipartisan support for this, for providing security assistance to Ukraine uh, throughout up to this point. I expect that we'll continue to see that going forward. We've heard some senior leaders on both sides of the fence uh, uh, say that. And so I expect that that'll, we'll continue to enjoy that support. Well, you know, Dan, Ukraine matters. It matters not to just Ukraine or to the United States. It matters to the world. This is about the rules-based international order. It's about uh, one country's ability to, uh, to wake up one day and change the borders of its neighbor and annex uh, its neighbor's uh, sovereign territory. And as we've seen, countries around the world uh, don't think that's a good idea. And that's why you've, you've seen 50 countries not only come to the, you know, the initial meetings of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, but they continue to come back and they continue to work hard to ensure that Ukraine gets everything that it needs to be successful and, and that'll remain our focus going forward so Dan on the uh, recovery piece we know where it landed in the Black Sea it's probably about maybe four or five thousand feet of water something like that so any recovery operation is very difficult at that depth uh, by anyone uh, that's the first point secondly is uh, true we don't have any ships there but we do have a lot of allies and friends in the area uh, we'll work through recovery operations that's US property uh, and, and we'll we'll leave it at that at this point but uh, uh, it probably broke up. Uh, there's probably not a lot to recover, frankly. Uh, as far as uh, the loss of anything of sensitive uh, intelligence, et cetera, uh, as normal, we would take, uh, and we did, take uh, mitigating measures. Uh, so we are quite confident that whatever, uh, whatever was of value is no longer of value. Our next question will go to Ellie Watson, CBS. Thanks for doing this. Secretary Austin, um, General Milley mentioned the video. We've heard reports there are you're working to declassify video of the incident. What does that video show, and when will that video be released? Why hasn't it been released yet? And General Milley, uh, Secretary Austin talked about the pattern of behavior. How often is Russia conducting these harassing maneuvers, and has it increased in recent weeks? Well, uh, thanks, Ellie. As, as, uh, as you know, as you said, we are still going through uh, videos and, and and photographs to uh, to ascertain what uh, what we can release, what we can provide. Uh, but in terms of what the video shows, we remain confident in the facts that we have conveyed thus far. 
uh, and I that will not that will not change in terms of you know what happened and how it happened, uh, and and so again we'll work through uh, as quickly as we can to evaluate videos, and if uh, we'll let you know when we have something that we uh, in terms of video or stills that we can provide you. So. In terms of the pattern of behavior, Ellie, um, yes, this is a part of a pattern of behavior. Uh, the United States and Russian military forces operate in proximity to each other uh, throughout the world. Uh, we're operating in the Middle East and Syria, for example. Uh, the, the, uh, we have uh, areas up in Alaska that uh, routinely either maritime or aerial vessels uh, come in contact uh, in the, in the uh, maritime areas outside of Hawaii, for example, but also obviously uh, in Europe and particularly in Ukraine. Uh, so the fact that we operate in proximity to each other is not particularly unusual. Uh, and we do try to establish deconfliction channels uh, in order to make sure that our forces are physically separated and we don't have incidents like this. But there is a pattern of behavior recently where there is a little bit more aggressive actions being conducted by the Russians. Uh, we think uh, we haven't completed our analysis as to why that's happening. Uh, that we, and it wasn't just involving us. There were some incidents uh, earlier with the British and some other, uh, other nations as well. So there is a pattern of behavior going on here, and we have to figure out exactly what the way ahead is. Uh, I think that was one of the uh, fundamental reasons for Secretary's uh, call to uh, Minister Shoigu and one of the fundamental reasons for my call to uh, uh, General Garizma. Go to Nancy Youssef, Wall Street Journal. Thank you. Uh, General Milley, I was wondering if you could clarify something you said earlier. You said the U.S. has a lot of allies and friends in the region, um, referring to the Black Sea. Am I to take from that that the U.S. is prepared to send or request allied ships to go in and survey and possibly recover uh, the drone, or is the expectation that the U.S. has does not intend to recover the drone. And then, Secretary Austin, I'd like to um, go back to some comments you made in Brussels. You said that Bakhmut was largely symbolic. Um, are you concerned that the Ukrainian investment in Bakhmut potentially takes away resources that could be applied to the spring offensive and risks um, the outcome of that offensive? Thank you. I, if you don't mind, I'll go first. Uh, Nancy, I, um, first of all, let me applaud uh, the valor, the persistence that we've seen uh, from the Ukrainian soldiers. And they have done amazing things in Bakhmut. I think the Russians have been working to take Bakhmut for some seven months or so now. And they haven't been very successful. And that's because of the diligence, the commitment, the focus of the uh, Ukra uh, Ukrainian soldiers. In terms of the significance of Bakhmut, I would say, I would point to the fact that President Zelensky is fighting this fight. And he will make the calls on uh, what's important and what's not important to his forces and whether he needs to reposition or remain in Bakhmut. The point that I would make is, if he does make a call to reposition at some point in time, it doesn't mean that uh, the war is lost. Uh, it, it may mean, and probably will mean, that he is positioning himself to uh, maintain uh, advantage. And, and so I think that's the real key there. But whether or not he stays there or how long they stay there, that's President Zelensky's call and not, uh, you know, not anybody else's. And again, our goal is to make sure that we're supporting him in whatever decision he's gonna, battlefield decision he's going to make. And by the way, we're generating combat power to a degree that we believe that it will provide them uh, opportunities to change the dynamics on a battlefield uh, at some point going forward. Whatever point that is, whatever, you know, whatever they want to do uh, in the future, I think the, the platforms, the, the training, the sustainment, the maintenance that we're providing, uh, is it will make a significant difference. And as we work through all of this with our allies and partners in detail today in the meeting, uh, we are on pace. And that's uh, in large measure be, uh, due to uh, the professionalism of our forces who are con conducting the training and equipping, but also forces around, the, uh, around Europe. As the chairman pointed out, uh, there, are, there are a number of countries that are conducting training in, in, in their countries. They're providing various platforms. Uh, and, uh, and we're really focused on how we're going to sustain those platforms as well. So. And Nancy, on the question of uh, the recovery piece, I wouldn't read too much into what I said. Uh, we do have allies and friends in the region. Uh, we don't have any uh, naval surface vessels uh, in the Black Sea at this time. 
uh, and we'll work up options. But as I said at the outset, this is uh, probably about four or 5,000 feet of water, uh, and it probably, don't know for certain yet, we, it'll be days before we uh, have uh, actual facts on the, on the impact and what debris is there, probably sank uh, uh, to some significant depths. Uh, so any recovery operation from a techno standpoint would be very difficult. If there is reason to believe that we could or sh uh, recover something, then we'll work up options for the Secretary and the President to consider, and we'll move from there. But we do have options, uh, and we do have friends and allies in the region. Okay, we have time for one more. Let's go to Kasim. questions. Uh, Chairman Mali, you were uh, in Syria earlier this month, and uh, that visit hit a lot of headlines in Turkey. Uh, and e eventually the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs summoned Ambassador Flake to the ministry to provide an explanation. Um, what was the message behind your uh, visit, sir? And uh, to Secretary Austin, uh, Turkey has requested um, to buy NIV F-16s and also m modernization kits for its existing fleet. Uh, and Ankara is saying that um, n lack of approval as soon as possible will not only undermine the Turkish national security, but also the security of NATO. So I would, ask, I would, I would, uh, would like to ask uh, your, assess your insights on this assessment and your thoughts uh, about providing uh, Block 70 F-16s to Turkey. Thank you. Yeah, well, Turkey's a NATO ally, and uh, we have a strong, a long-standing uh, strong relationship with Turkey, and we intend to do everything possible to keep it that way. Um, it's real important to us that we maintain interoperability between our NATO uh, allies, and, and so that'll always be a focus. It'll always be a priority. Um, as you know, Typically, we don't uh, comment on any pending uh, equipment sales uh, prior to Congress being notified, so uh, I don't have any comments to make on, uh, on that particular FMS case. Uh, but, uh, but again, I would just highlight the fact that Turkey remains a very valuable partner, and we'll make sure that we're doing everything we can to continue to strengthen our relationship. And um, for my visit, it was nothing more than a routine troop visit to determine uh, the task, purpose, mission, uh, to go out and check on that, see how we're doing, uh, and to assess things like force protection, et cetera. We've got you know, almost 1,000 troops in Syria, and, and they are at risk. Uh, they are uh, attacked from time to time with various types of munitions by various uh, actors that are in the area of Syria. Uh, so I want to go over and, and check on them and to make sure that uh, the mission is validated and, and I come back and report out to the Secretary on, on what that is. Now, with respect to Turkey, uh, Turkey and the United States have a common interest here, and we have had a common interest for years. We've been there for years. Uh, and the common interest is to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. Uh, ISIS, the caliphate, uh, was destroyed, uh, but the organization, there's still remnants of that organization over there. Uh, there's still uh, refugee camps and prison camps that are there that we're helping out uh, folks, training folks to help secure those. So it's in our interest, and it's in, the, it's in Turkey's interest. Uh, and, and it's uh, for sure something that I needed to do, and, and it's, uh, it's appropriately, uh, perfectly appropriate for the chairman to go check on uh, how the forces are doing, and especially when they're in harm's way. Secretary Austin, General Milley, thank you very much. Gentlemen, this concludes the time we have available today. Thank you very much.